Jesus, I'm frail. I'm so very weak. My faithfulness fails. My courage will flee. But you are my rock, my shelter and shade. When I'm burdened down. for grace and mercy anew I must have your strength oh I must have you Good morning. Let's go ahead and take our seats as we prepare here. Our call to worship comes from Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And please give attention to this great gospel text as we prepare our hearts for worshiping our Lord together. Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, in his love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for having mercy on us and saving us according to that mercy. And thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to empower us to do your will. Strengthen all of us this morning to praise you for you are truly worthy and deserve all of it. Lord, we also ask that you continue to sanctify us and cause us to be more and more distinct from the world. 
You tell us that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That is only possible by believing, remembering, and keeping the gospel primary every day. Every good thing we do will fall short if we are not doing it for the advancement of your kingdom. Our good deeds must look different than the unbelieving worlds. Help every good deed we do point to you, Lord Jesus. May we be wise, bold, and gentle as we verbally point to you, and may our deeds be consistent with those words. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together this morning. My faith has found a resting place From guilt my soul is free I trust the ever-living one His wounds shall plead for me And I need no other argument And I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out I need no other argument And I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died And that he died for me heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. And I need no other argument, and I need no other plea. Is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost He came to save. precious blood he shed and for me his life he gave I need no other argument and I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me done great things we will say together we will feast and weep no more we will not be burned by the fire cause he is the Lord our God and we are not consumed by the flood 
reading today comes from James chapter 1 verses 9 through 18. Remember that James is writing to those who are running for their lives due to persecution and he gives us some timeless wisdom to help us understand trials and temptation rightly. Please follow along as I read James chapter chapter 1 verses 9 through 18. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust." Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Let's pray. Father God, you know how weak and frail and forgetful we are. 
We waste so much time and effort trying to avoid the trials that you have designed to sanctify us. Please forgive us for that. Help us remain under our trials and draw near to you in the midst of them. Help us not grow weary in doing good and help us see the good that is produced from that. And Holy Spirit, please capture our attention and galvanize our praise to worship you rightly through the praying, singing, and preaching of your word. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to sing. Great God from me, there's not concealed. This is my inward frame. To thee I always stand revealed Exactly as I am Since I can hardly therefore bear What in myself I see How valiant dark must I appear Most holy God to thee But since my Savior stands between Garments dyed in blood To see instead of me is seen If I approach to God just though a sinner I am saved, be pleased before the throne. His life and death in my behalf calls my sins his own. The wondrous love would mystery. Disappointment shine My breaches of the law are his His obedience mine Great God from thee There's not concealed I seize my inward frame to thee I always stand revealed Exactly as I am What wondrous love, what mystery And this appointment shine My breaches of the law are his His obedience Mine. Wondrous love, but mystery, and this appointment shine. My breaches of the law are his, and his obedience mine. And his obedience mine. So be smile. I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face I hope that in some favored hour 
once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. this I trembling cry wilt thou pursue thy worm to death tis in this way the Lord reply I answer prayer for grace and faith These inward trials I implore From self and pride To set thee free And break thy schemes Of earthly joy That thou mayst find Thy all in me Let's pray. God, you are a faithful and loving God, and we are a people that are disobedient. We are people that um, go through various trials, and we try to lend on our own understanding. We try to lend on, lean on things that are of this world that will fall away. But God, we are so thankful that you are merciful, you're gracious, and you're the only thing that sustains us. God, here are Hear our praise this morning, um, and we just ask that as we open your word that we will continue to be faithful to you and that you would receive glory. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to see all of you this morning. Let's take our Bibles where we left off last time I was here at Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter 9, that's where we're going to pick up this morning, our study of Hosea. And uh, we're, we're entering a, a couple of chapters, 9 and 10 especially, that are, that are difficult, they're hard. I was telling somebody, this is, one well, of the seminary guys, this is not one of those chapters that guys pick for their seminary lab sermons where they have to preach before the professors. It's, no one's ever picked Hosea 9, uh, ever. And, and now one of them's going to probably do it just because I said that. But, but Hosea 9 is a hard text. Uh, it's, it's, it's a hard text full of hard words with, with a hard message. And, and my job, week in and week out, is to help us understand what it's saying. But, but I want you to understand this. Hard words like this were written for me and you. It's very tempting for us to think another time, another place, ancient Near East, hundreds, 2,700 years ago, it's just a foreign environment, and yet we think this isn't for us and that there's nothing there. But I want you to hear what, as we begin, what the Apostle Paul says, uh, Paul Sr. has to say about, uh, about understanding the Old Testament. And sometimes we get to places like this and we say, is there, uh, how do I even need to approach this, this passage? And Paul says this, almost in passing, in Romans 15, verse 4, but I think it's important for us just to keep out in front of us. He says, for whatever was written in earlier times, he's talking about the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of those scriptures, we might have hope. 
And, and so the Lord is, is teaching us, he's instructing us, he's guiding our hearts, he's convicting us of sin, he's showing us things about ourselves so that we might have hope, so that we might understand what God has for us, even in a passage that might seem like a foreign planet to us, which is Hosea 9. Also a long time ago, uh, about 2,000 years ago, uh, there was a Roman poet named Horace. He was a, a Stoic poet, philosopher, not a believer, and, and he would write these letters, he called them his epistles, to his friends, and he, he wrote one to his, his patron who supported him. That's the only way you can be a poet, then or now. Um, and, and he said something almost in passing. He said... Uh, interrogate the writings of the wise, asking them to tell you how you can get through your life in a peaceable, tranquil way. Get through your life in a peaceable, tranquil way. Maybe not in those same words, but I'm hearing people say things like that all the time. I just want peace. In my marriage, at my job, in our country, in our city, in my neighborhood, in my relationships, Financial peace, marital peace, relational peace. I just want peace. I just want to get through life in a peaceable way. And Horace was, in essence, asking. He's asking the question. He never found the answer, by the way. But he was asking the question, how can I just get through life in one piece with just a little bit of peace and quiet? And because he was a Stoic and he, he tried to reckon with his, his own weaknesses, but, but he never saw it for what it was. He never got the answer. He never found what he was looking for. And you may have heard in recent times these same kind of things. For, for us to find peace, we're going to we're gonna have to reckon with a few things. We're going to have to come face to face with some hard realities. You, you hear this all the time. It is, it is preached to us. It is spoon-fed to us constantly, day after day. Just a little sampling. If we're going to have peace, we're going to have to reckon with injustice. We're going to have to reckon with a teetering economy. We're going to have to reckon with a broken health care system. We're going to have to reckon with runaway inflation or the destruction of the family or with societal violence. And the list goes on and on and on and it never ends. And, and we feel like we wake up every day and, and the world, the media, our friends, maybe our own hearts, add something else to that list. It becomes a burden. And no one is able to shoulder it. No one is able to carry it. And we find ourselves like Horace writing to his patron. I just want some peace. Maybe for him, it was... He was going to stick his nose in the Stoic philosophers, and that's what you got to do. You got to, you got to study philosophy. Oh, that, that didn't work. It still doesn't work. Uh, maybe it's getting in touch with this or that. Maybe it's just giving money to something. Maybe it's uh, being a better student of history and all those kind of things. All of these things on that list that is ever-growing are just, you need to understand this rightly, they're just windows and into a, an entirely broken system. And that system that is broken is the human heart. If we look at those windows and say that that is the whole system, we're missing it. We've got to look through those windows and say, what does this tell us about the human condition? What does this tell us about the fallen man condition before God? The fundamental problem that we must interrogate is one that plagues every single person made in God's image. And it's this. There is an infinite gap. There is a disparity. There is a gulf between every single person and God, between the creator and the creature. Every single person. If, if we fill in that gap with anything else, then we will miss the point. For anything else to make sense, you must start by reckoning with your creator. There's a lot of problems, a lot of problems in the world, and they're not going to go away without God's finally dealing with them in his own way. Some will persist, some will ebb and flow, some will go away, but they'll manifest in some other way. I always say, if it wasn't this, it would be something else. If we weren't arguing about this, fill in the blank, it would be something else. Sin has a way of 
manifesting that way in all of us. The fundamental problem that we need to interrogate is, is that disparity, that gulf between us and the Lord without Christ. The problem is that mankind has wandered away from God since the beginning. And for anything else to make sense, you must start by reckoning with your creator. You must reckon with the God of scripture. Nothing else will come together. And Hosea 9 enters this larger discussion and it calls us to reckon with the wandering nature and destructive fruits of our sin so that we can have true peace with the only one who truly matters. Because what if you do get answers on some of those bullet point agenda items given to us by the world or our own hearts? But you don't know the Lord or you're living in rebellion against God. What if, I mean, go with me on this, maybe you've heard this before, what if you gain the whole world the way you think it should be gained, but you lose your soul? Does that sound familiar? What if you get everything you want on your list, and yet there's a gulf between you and the Lord? Or you know the Lord, you're a child of God, you belong to him, and yet, maybe I'm just not, maybe there's, it's God plus something else. Maybe it's God plus I need to revisit the bullet list. And maybe it's some of these other things. And, and I need to be serious about all of these other things the way I'm serious about God. And we begin to wander away. And we begin to think God's not enough. I want to ask a question this morning. How does sin deceive us and cause us to wander away from God? I'm talking to the beloved. I'm talking to believers. I'm talking to those who know Christ. And at the same time, we're also talking to unbelievers. Because this describes one of two things. It describes the, the temptation that believers have to, to wander away from our first love, to, to begin to believe our own press, to begin to believe that I need something else in addition to God or, 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 or whatever. Or it's identifying the gulf that is between you and God because you don't know him and you, you never have known him as an unbeliever. We're all here in one of those two streams. How does sin deceive us and cause us to wander away from God? And as Paul rightly identified in the Old Testament, that there are things that are just cyclical, they are endemic to human, humanity and, and, and mankind. That is true in this text as well. Men do not change the sins that are identified here. They may have a different name, they have different place names where they took place in Hosea 9, but sins don't change, mankind doesn't change. But there's good news, God doesn't change. And the same God that was merciful and loving and faithful is the same God who extends his mercy and grace to sinners like us. What we see here in this text is some pretty harrowing depths of sin. In fact, Hosea will call it that, the, the depths of depravity. And at the same time, if we, if we follow the lines here, and, and they're not spelled out in this chapter, which is why we never just take a chapter isolated from everything else. We have to start here, but there's some lines. If we put a pin here with a string on it, it's going to take us somewhere, isn't it? We're going to see that as well. Part of God's sanctifying work in his people is, is to expose idols. Idols are places of refuge, things that you trust in, things that you might rightly care about, but they become inordinate in that they take over your life. They consume your thinking. Uh, you become identified with them in such a way that that's all you talk about, that's all you think about. You, you serve it, you may give lots of money to it, you may serve it with your time, your attention, your affections, whatever. But it's a place of refuge where in that I'm going to find peace. In that I'm going, to, I'm going to have some rest and I'm going to be able to get what I want. But it's actually an idol. And we run to those things when times get tough. And we, Christians, I'm not talking about unbelievers, Christians run to idols. We're going to see that as well. 
How does sin deceive us? How does it cause us to wander away from God? I'm going to give you four of these this morning. In our chapter 9, our text, it breaks up into four sections. And the first one is there in the first section, verses 1 through 6, a false sense of security. When we start to think that our security is the most important thing to us, we love our security. Israel loved their security. Their sense of security was often bound up in whether they had some really pragmatic things, real basic things, enough groceries in the cupboard. Do you ever think about that? I mean, that, that's not a bad way to, to, te- to give a barometer test to things like the economy and how things are going. There are more cupboards stocked right now and pantries stocked than there were in the 1930s, Right? Uh, there, there, there are more jobs available and, and more plentiful and all that than there were in the 1930s. We understand those kind of things. We see, we can look at those kind of indicators and say, there's an abundance here. That means, well, that means what? It can mean any number of things. It means that my hard work is paying off. See, all those long hours at the office in Canaan, they paid off. See all these homes, see all these houses, see all this that we're able to provide. That's what Israel did. And they had their sense of security was bound up in whether they had groceries in the cupboard. They were very pragmatic that way. So, so what do you think they did when it looked like the harvest was going to be off the charts excellent? It was going to be wonderful. It was going to be amazing, possibly the greatest harvest they've ever had. They've been through some lean times. You know the story of Israel. They've gone through famine. That's, that's the story of Judges and Ruth. You, you know what's happening there. Uh, this is causing all kinds of hardship. When things got really good, they got really good. And so they get excited And then in steps Hosea, Mr. Party Pooper. Look at verse 1. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation like the nations. For you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. There's a party going on. There's a record player playing. Records outsold, CDs, more more than CDs last year, first time in a long time. Record players going, dancing, it's a wedding, it's a festivity, there's music, there's drink, there's food, people are having a wonderful time, the, the, the couple is there, the bride, the bride is there, we'll call her Israel, the bride is there, everybody's dancing, having a wonderful time, and, you know, just, it's just fantastic, and it's a beautiful place, and everybody's telling the father, what a, what a lovely wedding, what a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. And, and this guy walks in late to it all. He missed the ceremony, he missed everything. He comes late in the game, hundreds of years late, and he walks in, his name is, we'll call him Hosea. And he says, that woman is a whore. Is that shocking to you? That is what he says right here in verse 1. We just read it. And we become comfortable with those words when we read them in Scripture, which is why we're more shocked with what I just said than what we said when we read it the first time. That is what is happening here. That is the description. Israel, you're rejoicing. You're partying. You're enjoying the, 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 the harvest you played the harlot. And the way, the way you did that is you, he says there at the end of verse one, you, you have forsaken, or the middle of verse one, you've forsaken your God. It's possible that the harvest was looking good for that year. Israel would think, finally, all, all of our giving our attention to these idols is paying off. It's brought us this. All that extra time at the Canaanite office, all that, all that bowing down, all that work, all that energy to all those foreign gods. How can you say God's not blessing us? Have you not seen our cupboards? You ever hear that argument? How can you say they're wrong? Have you not seen the prosperity and the wealth? How can you argue with that? It's just an ancient argument, right? 
And Hosea steps in and he says, God's about to bring an end to your rejoicing. He says there in verse one, the, the, the shocking phrase, you played the harlot. You're literally, you're celebrating what is shameful. Strong words from the Lord through his prophet here. What's happening is that what Israel called worship, God called harlotry. The love and affection that is intended for the husband is sold away to a foreign nation in idolatry. Like a thoughtful husband, God provided Israel with what they needed, but, but they gave credit, they gave allegiance to the, to the pagan gods. We, we know this already from our earlier study back in chapter 2, verse 13. It says that Israel literally used to offer sacrifices to the gods of Baal. Here's something to kind of realize. It, it, it's, it, it's interesting to, to, to make these connections at times, that there's these intertextual connections of things that were said before this that kind of paved the way for this. And in fact, everything in chapter 9 was predicted long before, over 700 years before Hosea was on the scene. On the... Conceivably, the last day of his life, Moses delivers a final sermon. That sermon in our Bibles is called Deuteronomy. And then he dies. He's forbidden to go into the promised land. But on that final day, he, he gives a number of messages. He expounds. He says that, uses the word exposition in chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, he's given to expound the whole law and give it to this next generation so that as they go into the promised land, they will know what it means to walk with the Lord in his grace and mercy. That's what it's all about. What it means to have a, a heart that belongs to the Lord. What that looks like. And he gave a warning. He says, you're actually going to go away. You're going to be dispersed and, and all of that. You know the story. And it happened. It happened after Hosea. But he also gave a warning as well. And, and Moses said that, God told Moses that after Moses dies, everything that we see in Hosea is going to come true. And he even uses the same terminology. You don't need to turn there. But Deuteronomy 31 verse 16 Yahweh said to Moses, behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. Moses, you're about to die. And this people, Israel, will arise and they will play the harlot. Same group of words that he uses here in verse 1 of Hosea. They will play the harlot with the strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day. I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be consumed and many evils and troubles will come upon them so that they will say in that day, is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us? But I will surely hide my face in the day because of all the evil which they will do or they will, in turn, they will turn to other gods. What's going on here? Hosea is saying, I'm just telling you what Moses has already told you. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, I'm announcing, now the, war the warning really was given with Moses. Now Hosea is announcing the judgment. The warning's been given. You know, you're not gonna get another warning. This is about to happen. And it happens exactly like Moses said, it happens exactly like Hosea will say. You will turn to these other gods from foreign nations, from Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persians, on and on it goes. And then you'll be conquered by them and you'll be carried off and you'll never be the same. Until Hosea 3 and also Deuteronomy 30, until the Lord restores you as his people. But first, this is what's about to happen. This is what you've pursued. End of verse one. You have loved harlots' earnings on every threshing floor. There's a lot going on there. In short, here's what's happening. You, you've probably seen uh, pictures and of, or maybe you've been there and seen demonstrations of a threshing floor in Israel or in the ancient Near East. And, and they would have all no, number of things going on. They would have a big stone with an animal, a uh, beast of burden, turning that stone, grinding up uh, the wheat, making flour and all of that. Then they would use things to on the threshing floor where they would sift things out and sift the chaff away and bring all of this in and they would have the bounty there they would have the flour or whatever it was that they were working on at the time and and what they're seeing is it is really starting to pile up the good stuff the gold is starting to pile up and it's looking like an amazing harvest 
But what's also intimated there at the end of verse 1 is that intertwined with this desire for a great harvest, because that equals abundance, that equals success and jobs and everything else at that time, that they were also intertwined with that was this pagan idolatry. All sorts of lewd, awful practices that were also taking place at that same place. The idea seems to be that they gave credit to the gods for whatever they had been provided. There also seems to be an indication of just gross and immoral celebration accompanied by the harvest. Have you seen this? Probably not like that. But have you seen people celebrating what should not be celebrated? Have you celebrated? Maybe even in your own heart, just what should not be celebrated. Enjoying revelry and debauchery. It's, it's, like, they're, it's like they're putting a wedding dress on a corpse. The, the clothing doesn't fit the occasion. Is it possible that moments of rejoicing and celebration cause us to forsake our God or turn aside? So what does God do? Verse 2. Don't worry, we'll pick up speed. Verse 2. Threshing floor and wine press will not feed them, and the new wine will fail them. So you're going to get this amazing abundance, this amazing harvest. All this stuff is going to come in, but it's not going to be enough. You're not going to be satisfied. Uh, old men, uh, let's say 45 and, or over 45. All right, so you're, you're old at over 45. Um, 45 and over. Imagine having the provisions that you have when you were 13. And imagine having that discussion with 13-year-old you and saying, you'll once make this. Your, your jaw would not, it just would have been below the floor, right? You wouldn't have believed it. I'm gonna be wealthy beyond my wildest dreams. I'm gonna have everything that I could possibly want. I'll buy every Lego that I ever wanted. I'll have all the game systems. I'll have, a whole, I'll have a whole house devoted just to gaming. And then you get it. And now you got it. And it's not what it was, is it? The reality hasn't changed. It's still the same amount of money. It's still, a, it's still an incredible abundance in different ways. And it's piled up and it's not enough to satisfy. That's what's happening in verse two. You got what you wanted and, and it's not enough. It, it, it fails you. It doesn't feed you. We're still hungry. We just, we saved up. We went to the most amazing buffet, if they still have those. We went to all this stuff. We just gorged and, and we're still hungry, verse two. We, we drank and we drank and we drank. We even created our own vineyards and all these things and it, and it failed us. God begins to remove everything they trusted in, all that they worked for. He takes away, he removes, he purges, he cleans house, he sanctifies them. He does this by removing, listen, any lasting security in this life. Everything that you would hope and trust in, whatever that is, God is very capable of removing that or showing you it, what it is for what it really is. This is meant to awaken them to the fact that only God is the true God. He is the one who gives and takes away. Didn't we just sing this? You give and take away. You give and take away. Do we believe that? That's, that's what's happening here in verse two. Added to that, verse three, they will not remain in Yahweh, the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt and in Assyria they will eat unclean food. Here's what he's saying in short. Yahweh will is, is about to kick you out. And, and when you see the word land, especially in the Old Testament, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's ex extremely significant because there is a motif, there is a theme that is woven all throughout Scripture, and that motif comes even from the New, Old Testament into the New Testament, even into the Beatitudes and everything else, and that is God has shown something about the land. It, it's there to show you something about his character. How God revealed himself to Abraham and, or Abram and all the patriarchs and Israel and 
God's gonna place you in a, put you in a place where you're gonna have abundance and all of that you need and you'll have peace and tranquility and safety, but it will not be because the Assyrians or anyone else has brought that to you. It's because God alone has given you that. But there, that's not gonna remain, that, that situation's not gonna remain static in its current condition where Hosea is. And he says, they're not gonna remain in the Lord's land. Yahweh's about to kick you out. Not only will you lose your cupboard, you will lose the entire property. Now he mentions Ephraim, but Ephraim will not return to Egypt. Remember, we've seen this before in Hosea, Ephraim is a stand-in for all of Israel. Ephraim is the largest tribe to the north, primarily where Hosea is addressing this. And, and Ephraim is a stand, he's saying all of Israel. But that's, that's the one also that borders Assyria. That's the, that's the sugar daddy, Assyria. They're the ones that are paying for everything. They're, they're the ones that are importing their gods. And so Ephraim's right there in the, in the thick of it. They're closest to the action. That's ground zero for all this idolatry. And this particular area uh, is around Samaria. It had enjoyed a measure of freedom uh, under Assyria. They had security. Uh, they were under its protection, or so they thought. And then he also mentions here something else that's a little bit strange in verse 3. He mentions Egypt, but Ephraim will return to Egypt. Now, how do you interpret that? How do you understand that? Now, that can mean Israel, Ephraim, will return to Egypt. It can mean that, but I don't think that's what it means, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Every time we see the, the, the placeholder, Egypt, in Hosea, not in the Bible, but in Hosea, it's telling us something else. It's actually reminding Israel of its past, and what happened to you in the past is going to happen to you again in the future. What happened to them in the past? They were enslaved in Egypt. Now, how do we get that interpretation? Well, we'll see it here in just a second. But, but every mention of Egypt in Hosea is a historical reference point that looks back in order to look forward to what's gonna happen in the future. Kind of like remember the Alamo. Look at something back that's going to happen again, or we use it as a rallying point or object lesson. For Israel, Egypt was a continual reminder of their former life in slavery. That's how you got the whole Passover, right? They don't have to go back to Egypt and experience the Passover every, every time, uh, but it's a constant reminder every Passover. When you read Egypt and Hosea, it's a symbolic reminder of their past captivity. Now we have all these references to Egypt, but they are actually pointing to something else. This, this imagery will finally become clear in chapter 11, verse five. They, he, Hosea says, all these references to Egypt, it's not what you thought it was. They will not return to the land of Egypt. He says that there, 11, five, but Assyria. He, Assyria, will be their king and, because they refuse to return to me. So what happened back then is gonna happen again, but this time it's gonna be with Assyria. Now let's just pan out for a minute. Can God do that? Can God use, I mean, Assyria doesn't know the Lord. This is a pagan nation full of idols, importing their idols into Israel. And Israel's complicit and they love it and they get what they want and their cupboards are full and they got plenty of silver and gold. They've got everything they want. They even have a, a, a broader pool at, from which to choose wives and all of these things. I mean, it's just, it's amazing from Israel's standpoint. But can God judge a nation like Israel through a foreign nation like Assyria? Is God big enough to use pagan nations to accomplish a sanctifying work among his people? And we have to ask, if he did it not once but multiple times, and how many nations are mentioned in the Old Testament? Could he do it again? Or is God's, are God's hands tied? Do you remember what the writer of Hebrews says? For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Yes, God can sanctify his people no matter what border they're between. Verse four, they will not pour out drink offerings of wine to the, to the Lord Yahweh. Their sacrifices will not please him. Their bread will be like mourner's bread. 
Note this in the, in the end of middle of verse four. All who eat of it will be defiled for their bread will be for themselves alone. It will not enter into the house of Yahweh. What will you do on the day of a, the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of Yahweh? It's asking a series of questions here, very important. Implied here in verses four and five is that they think they can just keep going through the motions of worship. Not only this, but what they do in worship is actually judgment. Sound familiar? Let me, let me connect the dots for you. That what they're eating and drinking to themselves, for themselves, is judgment. Sound familiar? Get a little warmer? Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly that it is possible to go through the motions outwardly of perfunctory worship and do certain things outwardly and actually have a heart that is removed from God or a heart that is cold to God or a heart that doesn't belong to him at all. That's what he's saying there in verse four. They're, they're going through the motions of the religious festivals and yet it's just for themselves alone. It's not for God. And then what a profound question in verse five. The rhetorical question that is there, what will you do on the appointed festival on the day of the feast of the Lord? The answer is nothing. There's nothing you could do to please God. What are you going to do on Passover or Pentecost 40 days later or the Feast of Tabernacles where you, Israel, you keep remembering my works but you forget me? They would, probably included as all of these, they would, they would celebrate P Passover where they were to remember the Lord's redeeming and saving hand. How are you gonna do that with, with the cup of redemption in one hand and the cup of blessing and your idols in the other? How are you gonna do that, he's asking. What about Pentecost? Even more to the point and a little bit on the nose here where you remember that God's giving of grain and harvest how are you gonna do that when you're performing lewd acts on the threshing floor? What about tabernacles? Where you remember idols instead of the one who promises, who fulfills all of his promises to you. What will you do, he says? It's better to have no religion than a false religion. Do you remember what Jesus said when he cleared the temple? He said, it's my father's house. It's my father's house. You've made it a den of thieves. And you know the one who is most robbed in that? Not in his character, not in his essence, not in his person, but you know who's most robbed in all of that? It's God. Because the worship that is devoted and is set apart and the life and the grain and the first fruits and all of those things that are supposed to be there as just an indication of God's greatness and glory and provision, they are turned on themselves for themselves. And God is the one who is robbed. God already said back in chapter six, verse six, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. It's that you know me, the Lord says. He says that to us as well. It's that it, the most important thing is that you know me, he says. He says, verse six, for behold, or look at this, they will go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. Memphis will bury them. They will go off. They will be carted off to another nation in exile. It happened multiple times again and again and again and because of destruction. He mentions Egypt again. There, there it will be Assyria. Egypt is like, a, Assyria is like Egypt. will gather them up. And then he says uh, another odd reference. Memphis will bury them. Is he saying here prophetically that the evil people of Memphis, Tennessee will swoop down? <laughs> no, that's not what he's saying. We have another look back, another reference to Egypt, and this time it's Memphis, which was about 20 miles south of Cairo, modern Cairo. And what you need to know about that, it was a burial place. You're not, you're, they're not actually going to Memphis, but they're going to be buried. 
You're going to leave the land. You're going to be carted off by Assyrians, and you're going to be buried. You're not coming back. You're, this generation, they're going to die. So it symbolizes the ultimate destination of the exiles. It's a foreign graveyard. And then he says at the end of verse 6, weeds will take over their treasures of silver. Thorns will be in their tents. Let me ask you a question. This is, you might not like this question, but I don't, I don't care. Um, what do you think is going to happen to all your stuff? What do you think is going to happen to your house? Weeks, years, decades, whatever. What, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we don't know. And this is not to rain on anybody's, you know, redecorating parade that they're having at the moment. Uh, but, but just know this, that it's not going to always be this way. And, and in fact, um, it's possible that, and we see pictures of this all the time, where communities or neighborhoods are abandoned, and in just a matter of days and weeks, things start to just take over man's creation, right? They just start to, I know exactly what would happen to my house in about two days. There would be crabgrass and Dallas grass in the kitchen growing, and it would not be exterminated. Weeds will take over their treasures of silver. Thorns will be in their tents. What, what will happen to all those things that you've worked hard for? You have worked all these years just to get the ultimate vacation, which becomes retirement, or, or to, to set up the family in a certain way, or have all the stuff hidden away in banks and treasures and all of these things, and that becomes our security. And we really say, you know what, things are looking really rough in the world, but I'm checking, you know, I'm checking my stuff you know, on the app every day, and we're all right. Are you? Weeds will overtake their treasures of silver. Thorns will be in their tents. It'll be long after me, you might say. That reveals the heart. Now, if we say, I don't have to worry about it. I'm gonna enjoy it now. It'll be long after me. I don't care what happens to it all. That is an indication of what's in the heart even now. Be careful. Hosea, in essence, says this beautiful place, it's going to become a parking lot. And whatever you place your security or, or whatever you identify with that is not from the Lord or submitted to his lordship, it will be taken away. Or it will be reduced for what it is. Or it will be exposed for what it is. A false sense or trust and security. Listen, friends, you know this if you've been around for a while. It will cause your heart to wander away from God. Some of you just need to hear that as a warning. You haven't even gotten down that road yet. You're just preparing. You're just thinking about it. You're just getting ready for certain things. There are others who are already far down that road. And if you don't listen, you're going to find out this in a really hard way. Secondly, a hostile reaction to truth. A hostile reaction to truth. Verse 7 through 9. Look at verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of retribution have come. Let Israel know this. The prophet is a fool. The inspired man. He's demented. Because of the grossness of your iniquity and because of your, because of your hostility is so great. There's a number of things going on here. First of all, note those, those two verb phrases there, have come, twice there at the beginning of verse 7. The tense of these words tells us that though this lies out in their future, this event is so certain from Hosea's perspective and God's, it's as if it's already taken place. It's as good as done. Why is that important? Because as, as Hosea is delivering this message, they're counting their silver and their gold. Their, their vats are full. Their cupboards are full. Everything's fine. Well, I mean, how could he say that? But he states it in such a way, he says, it's already happened. It's already happened. Though it hasn't happened historically, it's, it's as if it has. It's as good as done. Take it to the bank. Let Israel know this. And this is what, and this is what they think about a guy with that kind of message. Also there in verse 7. How can he say that? I mean, look, things are good. 
I mean, we're not some of those other countries. I mean, the economy is still trucking along. Things are fine, whatever. Whatever temporary foolish markers we use to judge how things are going apart from God, you know, they were using those. And you know what they reasoned? Because he came up with this message or he came to them with this message. Look at what they say in verse 7. This guy's a fool. This prophet is a fool. The the word there means a, a distraught, crazy person. He's out of his mind. This is an accusation against Hosea. The word, they use the word demented in the NAS. He's raging mad. He's crazy. Now, interestingly, they as they hurl this at him for, for having this just bizarre message. How can you say we're going to destruction? Have you not seen my home? How can you say I'm in sin? I don't even believe in sin. Someone told me that once. How, how can you say I'm going to hell? Not a problem. I don't believe in it. Someone told me that once. The inspired man. He's crazy. Now, there's one of a couple of things that might be going on here. They, they might be saying it tongue-in-cheek. Our so-called inspired man, wink, wink, he's crazy. He's nuts. But they may also be just recognizing the truth. The, the man that's come to us, the man that is identified, it, it, literally the man of the Spirit, the man of the Spirit, he's crazy. So what they're doing, get this, and this is all throughout Hosea, Their own words are judging them. At the same time, in the same sentence, they're recognizing that he is a man of the Spirit. He is sent by God to deliver the message. And at the same time, in the same sentence, they're rejecting it. The inspired man, the prophet. That's true of all prophets. That's true of all the Old Testament, New Testament prophets. They are sent directly by God. Their message is always from the Spirit. If it's not, in the Old Testament, they stoned them. They did a little bit of that in the book of Acts. 2 Peter 1, verse 21, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. A prophet was always one who spoke direct revelation from God by the Holy Spirit, and it was to be taken as the very word of God. But they turned aside and they said, he's nuts. Does this sound familiar? As you read into the New Testament, uh, Paul in Acts 26, verse 24, he appears before Festus and and he's making his defense there. And and Festus said, Luke says in Acts, in a loud voice, he's yelling at Paul, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. What did they say to Jesus? John 7, verse 20. You have a demon. There's all over the scripture. Jeremiah said, Jeremiah eleven nineteen. 19. He says, I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. He's talking about his ministry. And I did not know that they had devised evil plots against me. You know what they said? Jeremiah tells us, let us destroy the tree with its fruit and let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. They wanted to kill him. This is what happened with Paul. Think of Paul. The whole, the whole reason why 2 Corinthians exists in your Bibles is because Paul is having to defend his apostleship because not only have they not uh, failed to hear his message, now they turn their guns on him, the man, and they begin to attack him personally. Verse 8, Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a prophet, yet the snare of a bird catcher is in all his ways, and there is only hostility in the house of his God. Maybe a better translation of what's happening there, verse 8, is that the prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with God. In in other words, you're cutting yourself off from the voice of wisdom. You're cutting off yourself from the truth that you need to hear. Actually, the prophet, in this case, Hosea, he was a watchman over Ephraim, but Ephraim is throwing him out. And in fact, you've set a a, a self assured snare. You, you have a built-in self-destruct button and you're, you're pressing it again and again and again, Israel. Israel. 
snare of a bird catcher is in all his ways. There's only hostility. Everything the nation does has embedded into it a self-destruct mechanism when it's according to their sin. It's, it's not unlike um, Solomon as he addresses his son in, in Proverbs 1, and he warns them about going off and making friends with the world and having friends that don't honor God. And, and he says, what they don't realize is that as they go away and they say, come with us, we will lie and wait for blood, we'll ambush people, we'll become rich, we'll, we'll, we'll take advantage of others. And he says, what they don't realize is that they lie and wait for their own blood. It's self-defeating, it's self-destructive. And that's true, friends, of idolatry. That's what he says in verse eight. Verse nine, they have gone deep in depravity as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Now listen very carefully. Verse nine, if you were shocked at verse one, verse nine's worse. In fact, there's no way to do it justice. You just need to read Judges 19 and 20, which is what is is the historical background to verse nine here. Israel at the time of Hosea has gone so deep in depravity that what it brings to mind for Hosea is Gibeah. And you say, well, what happened there? Again, you need to read it, but here's the, the Sparks Notes version. You know judges, there's no king. Everyone's doing what is right in his own mind. And in Judges 19, the chapter begins that way. Chapter 19, verse 1, it says there's no king. That's a repeated theme all throughout Judges. And a Levite comes along with his concubine. That right there should have been enough to say, you know, there's a problem. And he comes and he goes to the Gibeonites and he says, let us stay here. And as they're staying there for the night, some men from Gibeah all around, they come to the house where he's staying and, and they're, they're crying for the men to come out so they can have their way with them. The men wanting to have their way with the men that are in the house. And, and the men, uh, you know, this is, they thought this was a good idea. They said, no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, we'll send out the concubine instead. And it is one of the darkest chapters in all the Bible. And they send the young girl out and they have their way with her all night and then they murder her, leave her body on the doorstep of the home. The next morning, the Levite's like, well, he throws her lifeless body on his animal. He gets her back. He chops up her body in 12 pieces and sends a piece to all the tribes. Do you read verse nine differently now? Your depravity, your chasing after idols, this is what it reminds me of. It is the depths of depravity. Just how deep. All God needs to do is mention the name Gibeah. Yeah, it was Saul's hometown. That didn't do it justice. But that dark event of Judges 19 and 20 comes into view as well. This is why this is shocking. If you love your sin more than you listen and heed and respond to God and his word, he says this is what is true. You are chasing the depths of your own depravity. Your reaction to God's word is no different, Israel. Thirdly, your corrupt perspective of morality. This will lead you astray, your corrupt perspective of morality. In verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit of the fig tree in its first season. He's saying here, uh, you, you were a pleasure. You were bountiful. You were, you, you were like a pleasant surprise, like walking on a hiking trail and stumbling across some wonderful wild fruit. But, middle of verse 10, they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame. And they have become detestable as that which they loved. You, you have here all in one verse the quickness of turning from fruitfulness and life-giving to this fruitless pursuit. Note that word in verse 10 in the middle, devoted. It comes from the same Hebrew uh, root, or family of words. It means to separate. It's the word that gives us our word holiness. 
to be separated, to be, uh, to be set apart, to be separated from and to something. To be holy. Remember they had separated themselves on another mountain, Mount Sinai, to God. We will be holy. We will be God's people. We will be set apart. But it wasn't long before they separated themselves, he says, on another mountain, but all pure. This is a past incident from many years before Hosea. So why does God bring it up again? Because he's saying nothing has changed. How fickle the religious affections of men. Their devotion was detestable to God. And as, verse 11, as for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Here's what's going on in verse 11. The, the name Ephraim, it actually means double fruitful. So not only was it the largest of the tribes, but, but it, was, it meant double fruitful. So this double fruit-filled nation or tribe within the nation, God will shut it all down and he'll do it because of their idolatry. He says in verse 12, though they bring, their, bring up their children, yet I will bereave them, not, uh, bereave them until not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart for them. Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted in a pleasant meadow like Tyre, but Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. Beautiful, something to admire on the surface, but very soon some really dark days, darker days are coming for this nation. Hosea sees this and he cries out, kind of like Haggai or Habakkuk, you know, how long, O Lord? How long? He kind of cries out that way and, and Hosea sees the depths and he, he's sent by God. He's the man of the spirit. Verse 14, Hosea speaking, give them Yahweh. What are you going to give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Take away their abundance. Take away any of their future. Kind of sounds like Jonah with the Ninevites there. Or just wipe them off the face of the planet. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's great for Israel, and I know what a lot of us are thinking, Lord, I thank you that we're not like them, right? Here's why this is important. Baal Peor, it, it, that happened in Numbers 24 and 25, that scene that's being described there, the setting apart and that past historical thing that happened 700 years before Hosea. Hosea saying it's still going on. In fact, all you need to do is be wiped off the face of the planet. That's what you deserve. But the, the scene of Baal Peor, it doesn't go away with the closing of the Old Testament we get in the New Testament. In fact, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and it's, and it's a passage that you probably know. It's one that you probably quote quite a bit. I know it gets quoted around here a lot. I'm thankful for that. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, you know what it says. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, right? You know the rest. You know what else is in that passage? Verses 1 through 12 of 1 Corinthians 10 is a historical walk down memory lane for Israel as a teaching reference and tool for the church so that they can see this. And one of the ones that he mentions there, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8, nor let us the church act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. He's talking about Baal Peor from Numbers 24 to Numbers 31. Immorality. And then he says, therefore, let whoever thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. You think it was just them? Wait a minute. Then no temptation has overtaken you, and God provides the way of escape. And then he says the next verse that we often forget, verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He's writing that to the church. Jesus had the same perspective. Jesus also used the same event to warn the church at Pergamum in Revelation 2, verse 14, how they sacrificed to idols and committed acts of immorality. Let me give you one more here at the end of our chapter. 
What else will cause us to wander away? And this goes hand in glove with point two as well. It is a deaf ear to wisdom. It is not only shutting out the word of God, but now you don't follow the word of God down the road that it takes you. Rather, you go to your own way. This is Psalm 1 territory, right? The only one who is truly blessed is the one who walks in the ways of the word of God day and night. That's his meditation. That's his life. That's his commitment. But anybody else who who walks, stands, and runs in the other paths, you're just doomed to destruction. It's a deaf ear to wisdom. This manifests itself in wicked rebellion in verse 15. All their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I came to hate them there. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. And all their princes are rebels. Gilgal means a circle. It was the place where Joshua took the stones uh, out of the Jordan as a memorial. It was also the place where Saul, the first king, was anointed. It has become the place where the fertility cult practiced its wicked rituals. All their princes are rebels. There's a, there's a point there at the end of verse 15. Notice it. So much of the nation's problems are traced back to a lack of leadership. I think that'll preach. All their princes are rebels. Let me, let me make one aspect of this without saying too much here at this point. Easy for us. Don't align yourself with liars. Don't align your heart with those who speak lies. Don't align your heart with those who are immoral. Don't trust in those who cannot deliver. All their princes are rebels. That sounds relevant. Uh, Verse 16, it's also fruitlessness. Fruitlessness. This is a deaf ear to wisdom. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They will bear no more fruit. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. Verse 16 is summarizing verses 10 through 15. It's a recapitulation here. A direct opposite of the fertility that they wanted. In short order, Assyria will turn on them and crush Israel. What does God have to do to pull off verse 16? You know what he does? He lets Israel go its own way. He takes his hands off of them. And this is what happens. They put their trust, their hope, their security, even their affections in something else. And then they are devoured, literally, by what they craved. And then finally, A deaf ear to wisdom looks like one who is unresponsive in verse 17. My God, Hosea says, will cast them away. Look, because they have not listened to him. And they will be wanderers among the nations. Guess, my friends, what happened to Israel to this day. Verse 17 is the summation of the entire chapter. They have not listened. Now that word there, you don't have to know Hebrew to know this, and Deuteronomy 6 uh, is Moses' last sermon. Deuteronomy 6, what does he say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Hear, O Israel, what's the word there? Shema, listen, hear. And it's not just hear the words that I'm saying audibly and as they bounce around in the interconnectedness of of your ear and all of those things. He's not just saying hear it that way because they could say, we've heard it. But the word means hear and obey. Hear and obey. And he uses the same word here, the same word group here. The implication is listen to God. The implication is obey God. For some reason, we seem to listen more attentively in moments of crisis. But as soon as we think we have it all under control, we turn back. What we fail to see, and I think this is happening right now, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I think it's happening. What we fail to see is that the crisis itself is a reminder that we don't listen. Israel's trouble is because they have become unresponsive to God, to his word, and to his works. And God is exposing sin and his wrath so that they will run to mercy. God is uncovering for us sin in Hosea 9. Not so we will just study it like under a microscope, but so that we will run to to mercy, 
so that we will crave mercy and grace and forgiveness and restoration more than we crave whatever it is that thing we keep craving. Now, there's a pin that we put down here in Hosea 9, and we could do this in all number of ways, but as we put a pin down here and we tie a string to it and we stretch it out, you can't talk about this without talking about how it's resolved from God's perspective at a particular place, and that place is called the cross. And isn't it interesting and isn't it wonderful that it's on the cross where something happens that has never happened before or since. That it's on the cross where the, listen to this, the fullness of God's wrath and the fullness of God's mercy are both poured out for the first and last time in that way. God has shown wrath and mercy before the cross. He's shown and will show wrath again after the cross and shows mercy every day, which is always new. But the fullness of his wrath and mercy are all drawn to that one point on the cross and they're poured out on Christ. Why is that important? Ask yourself a question as we study passages like this. What does God think about sin? Look at the cross. What has God done about sin? It's the same answer, isn't it? Look at the cross. What does God think about my sin? It's not as bad as Gibeah's, I can tell you that. Look at the cross. What does God think about my sin? It's, I'm not like her, I'm not as far off as, as they are. Look at the cross. And then, we see the weight of our sin. We see the depths of our depravity. And then what do we do? We look at the cross where Christ's life was given as a ransom. Christ's life was given as a substitute. Christ's life was given as the final full payment for sinners like us in our place. Look at the cross, friends. The cross of Christ, someone said, stands as a monument not only to the magnitude of God's love for sinners, but also to the heinous nature of sin itself. And we can never say as we look at the cross, Lord, it must have been something in me. But it was only in Christ. Dane Ortland, in his new book, Gentle and Lowly, he says this, it's not our loveliness that wins his love, it's our unloveliness. And that is true. God is merciful to us. If your idols have been exposed afresh, if the bandage has been pulled off this morning, don't run from that, but rejoice that God has also at the same time reminded you of his mercy and his grace and his pardon and restoration and forgiveness and his love, which surpasses all understanding. If you don't know that, Jesus, run to the cross in repentance and faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for difficult words. Though they are hard to preach, they are hard to hear, they are hard to respond to as we should. So Lord, help us take our own medicine here as we've been saying and to look to Christ at the cross where all of our sin has been met by your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, it's so easy for us to judge the world, to judge others, to see the sins of others as magnified over our own, and yet it's our sin. It's our iniquities. So Lord, again, we ask that you would work this into our hearts. Lord, that you would not allow your church here to wander away to our own self-made destruction. But Lord, that we would cling to the mercies and the truths of Christ and his cross and his work for us. We pray in his name, amen. Amen. You can remain seated as we sing together in this closing song. This song was chosen because of its significance to this passage and we'll also see the significance of the Lord's name as we continue throughout Hosea. Um, so just let us be a church that's marked by repentance. And, and, and as Christ has taught us to pray, let's pray that hallowed be your name. Merciful be your name. Blessed be your name. And that's what we're going to sing about now.
Um, and then hopefully as we go through our various trials, as we go through our disobedience and all these things, we still have to re be remembered and be reminded that God's name is blessed, that it is righteous and it is holy. So let's sing together. Blessed be your name, land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. And though the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name Cause you give and take away You give and take away And my heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Got a handful of announcements this morning. The first one is our membership class, Foundations of Grace, that will begin next Sunday at 9.45 a.m. It will be in the Grace Life rooms where we've currently been doing the overflow room, which is when we're full in here, people have gone down there. The overflow room will now be across the hallway in the youth room, because we've got quite a few people for the class. It is not too late to join the class, the membership class. If you're interested in that, please see or email Jared Pratico. That's jpratico at gmail.com. The second thing to announce here is we have two events coming for the young adults ministry. The first one is a kayaking opportunity here at the Elk River. That is this Saturday, September 19th. They'll first meet here at GCC in the morning at 8 a.m. It's $30 for the rental fee, water, lunch, and sunscreen. If you have questions about that or you would like to do that, you can email Corbin Stillwell. That's corbin.stillwell at gmail. The second thing for the Young Adults Ministry is a conference. That is the Devoted Conference. It will be from October 23rd to the 25th. That is at Ridgecrest Conference Center in North Carolina. The main speaker will be Jerry Ragg, and he'll be speaking on the subject of loving the church. The cost for that is $100 for individuals. For couples, it's $290, and that's like including the, the hotel room. Again, you can see Corbin Stillwell at Gmail for that. Corbin dot Stillwell. This fall, we will also be adding members to the GCC music team. We've got openings for every position. And if you are a member of GCC and interested, please email Tim Keeter. That's Tim Keeter at gmail.com. We have a lot of easy email addresses to remember here. Solid work. Um, offerings, if you would like to support the different ministries here at GCC, we have a chest on the other side of the wall there in the foyer. Looks like we hijacked it from the Black Pearl, but that did not happen. It's just a nice chest on the other side of the wall. Um, community groups, community groups is how we really cultivate and begin meaningful relationships here. It's just a structure we have to really try to do that. That's also where our men's and women's groups for Bible studies take place. 
If you're not part of that or you would like more information on that, you can email me. That's joshua.g.elmore at gmail. I think that's about all I got here. The youth will not meet this week. We'll be meeting next week here at GCC. And right before we hear our benediction, um, we're about to do that. Right before that, um, let's just be mindful of social distancing. Like after the fact, it's easier to do that. It's easier to fellowship outside or even in here rather than the hallway. And we'll dismiss section by section. We'll begin here. We'll go across and we'll end here. All right. We'll close the service now with benediction or blessing. That comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, which says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And you're dismissed.